Hi friends, this is week three, the lecture on God the Father. I want to start us out with a prayer. This prayer was written by Bernard of Clairvaux. Let's pray together. You are holy, Lord, the only God, and your deeds are wonderful. You are strong, you are great, you are the Most High. You are Almighty, you Holy Father, our King of heaven and earth. You are three and one, Lord God, all good. You are good, all good, supreme good, Lord God, living and true. You are love, you are wisdom, you are humility, you are endurance, you are rest, you are peace. You are joy and gladness, you are justice and moderation, you are all our riches and you suffice for us. You are beauty, you are gentleness, you are our protector. You are our guardian and defender. You are our courage. You are our haven and our hope. You are our faith, our great consolation. You are our eternal life, great and wonderful Lord, God Almighty, merciful Savior. Amen. As we continue to explore how we can begin to articulate a biblical theology of worship, let me remind you what David Peterson said in your textbook, the theme of worship is far more central and significant in Scripture than many Christians imagine. It is intimately linked with all the major emphases of biblical theology, such as creation, sin, covenant, redemption, the people of God, and the future hope. Far from being a peripheral subject, it has to do with the fundamental question of how we can be in a right relationship with God and please Him in all that we do. One way or another, most of the books from Genesis to Revelation are concerned with this issue. This is a big issue in Scripture, and it's one that's worth taking the time to study and to articulate what we believe that Scripture has to say about worship. Our basic outline for the project, we've got a brief introduction and then three major questions. Who is God? Who are we? And how can we respond to God? And then a brief conclusion. Now we've already talked about steps one and two. Step one was to define worship and defend your definition. Step two was to talk about the potential benefits of taking time to articulate a biblical theology of worship and the potential dangers of not taking time to do that. We're going to jump from the introduction into the first major section this week on this who is God question. Let me assure you we will not fully answer that question. Uh, please don't try to fully answer that question in your paper. You can't do it this side of heaven and maybe not even on the other side of heaven. I don't know yet. Um, but we can start to speak some of these things that he has revealed himself to be. And so this week we're going to look at who is God the Father, who is God the Son, and who is God the Spirit. Who is God, what has he done, and what does he expect from us? As we start to answer these questions, I want to introduce you to a guiding principle that, that honestly I probably should have, uh, we should have talked about from the very, very beginning. This guiding principle is that worship is a pattern of revelation and response. Now that's not really a definition for worship, but it shows this pattern that, that God is the one who initiates worship. God is the one who does the revealing. He reveals himself and then we are able to respond. We cannot respond unless he has first revealed himself. Thanks be to God, he has. So we'll see this pattern over and over and over throughout scripture, throughout our study that God reveals himself and then we respond. And that's why we ask ourselves first, who is God and not how can I respond? We need to start with the revelation part. How, who has he revealed himself to be? What has he revealed himself to have done? What has he said? Who, how, who has he shown himself to be? And in light of that then, we ask ourselves, how do we respond? Worship is a pattern of revelation and response. So who is God the Father? Well, first of all, He is our Creator. Uh, we see that in Genesis 1, and actually we'll see that the Son and the Spirit were also present at creation. Uh, but Genesis 1 especially points to us this, this reality that God the Father is our Creator. D.A. Carson says that worship is the proper response of the creature to the Creator. Worship does not create something new. Rather, it's a transparent response to what is. A recognition of our creaturely status before the Creator Himself. Danelle Franklin expands on that quote and says that apart from acknowledging that God is God and we are not, the perspective of creation should also cause us to consider the, the diversity with which we respond. 
created in his image, we must certainly expect to worship him with all of the creativity we can muster. God the Father is also our sustainer. Revelation 4 declares that he is worthy to receive glory and honor and power. Why? Because he created all things, and by his will they were created and have their being. So God the Father, the one seated on the throne, is worshipped in Revelation chapter 4 as worthy to receive glory and honor because he created, he's our creator, and because he is the one who gives us our being, who gives all of creation the ability to continue to exist. Acts 17 says it this way, The God who made the world and everything in it is the Lord of heaven and earth and does not live in temples built by hands. And he is not served by human hands as if he needed anything, because he himself gives all people life and breath and everything else. He sustains us. Throughout scripture, God the Father also shows himself to be both transcendent and eminent. Now Bob Coughlin talked a little bit about this in his Healthy Tensions in Christian Worship lecture that you listened to uh, in, in week one. Uh, we need to emphasize it. Is, these seem like opposites. He is transcendent. He is beyond us. He is unapproachable. He is holy. He is perfect. And yet he is also eminent. He is with us. He is our friend. Uh, he is close to the brokenhearted. He is both beyond us and with us. A hundred percent of both. Uh, and only God, of course, could do that. Dan Dozier says that when we say that God is eminent, we're saying that he is present with us. He abides with us. Even more, he abides in us. Herein lies the essence of mystery, the transcendent God the one who by his very nature is above and beyond us, is also the ever-present God who lives and abides in his people. He dwells among us. It's good news, my friends. Isaiah 54 says it this way, Your maker is your husband. The Lord Almighty is his name. The Holy One of Israel is your redeemer. He is called the God of all the earth. And we can see transcendence and eminence both all over this passage. Your maker he is transcendent. He's the only one who's able to make us. He is transcendent. Is your husband. There's an eminence word, that closeness word, that with, with us-ness word. Uh, the Lord Almighty, transcendence, is his name. He has revealed himself to us. He is with us. He is eminent. The Holy One of Israel, there's your transcendence again, is your Redeemer. He's eminent. He's with us. He's purchased us back for himself. And he is called the God of all the earth, both transcendent and eminent. Isaiah 57:15 For this is what the high and lofty one says, he who lives forever whose name is holy, I live in a high and holy place. We've got transcendence all over those first 3 lines of the passage, but then we see that he is also with him who is contrite and lowly in spirit, to revive the spirit of the lowly and to revive the heart of the contrite. 100% transcendent, 100% eminent, 100% beyond us, 100% with us. In Isaiah chapter 6, we have recorded Isaiah's vision of God in all his transcendence and also making himself known as imminent, as, as one who is with us. Isaiah 6 starts this way, In the year that King Uzziah died, I, Isaiah, I saw the Lord seated on a throne, high and exalted, and the train of his robe filled the temple. Above him were seraphs, each with six wings. With two wings they covered their faces. With two they covered their feet, and with two they were flying. And they were calling to one another, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord Almighty. The whole earth is full of his glory. At the sound of their voices, the doorposts and thresholds shook, and the temple was filled with smoke. Woe to me, I cried. I am ruined, for I am a man of unclean lips, and I live among a people of unclean lips, and my eyes have seen the King, the Lord Almighty. Then one of the seraphs flew to me with a live coal in his hand, which he had taken with tongs from the altar. With it he touched my mouth and said, See, this has touched your lips. Your guilt is taken away, and your sin atoned for. Then I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send, and who will go for us? And I said, Here am I. Send me. Isaiah saw the Lord seated on a throne, high and exalted, with the train of his robe filling the temple. Isaiah saw God in his most natural state on a throne. Now this isn't rocket science, but a throne symbolizes kingship. The Lord is the king. He is the exalted one. He is the powerful ruler of all. The robe is also symbolic of the fact that he is royalty, that he is majesty. 
The train of the robe was so great that it filled the temple. Isaiah saw God in his most natural state on a throne. He was wearing a robe reminding us that clothes are an indication of status and in this case the robe is an indication of his royalty and this train filled the temple. The temple was the most holy place, the place where God's glory rested. Now this does not mean that God is small or that God is limited to the temple. The, the Israelites understood that the temple was the place of God's dwelling but, but they did not by any means limit him to that. In fact in 1 Kings we read, but will, will God really dwell on earth? The heavens, even the highest heaven, cannot contain you. How much less this temple I have built. Above him were seraphs, each with six wings. With two, they, two wings they covered their faces, with two they covered their feet, and with two they were flying. Seraphs, or seraphim, as seraphim would be the Hebrew way to make it plural, an S, of course, would be the English way. Uh, so either way, it means more than one seraph, and depending on the translation you're using, you may see seraphs or seraphim. Seraphim were created beings, created by God, and they were created to minister in the direct presence of God and they were given exactly what they needed to do the job they were created to do. The God who created them gave them just what they needed to fill, fulfill a purpose. So with two wings they covered their faces, symbolic of their humility. Uh, remember that anyone who, who sees God dies uh, and so they were hum humbled themselves before him and covered their faces. With two they covered their feet. Uh, think like a Hebrew with me. Think uh, in, in concrete terms as far as images, our feet are what touched the ground. What were we created from? We were created from the ground. Uh, and so if the, the fact that, that they covered their feet was symbolic of the fact that they knew that they were created beings. It was also symbolic of their service to God. And with two wings they were flying, uh, symbolizing their ongoing activity in proclaiming God's holiness and his glory. They were calling to one another, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord Almighty. The whole earth is full of his glory. God's holiness is that which sets him apart from everything else. It's a description that applies to his every characteristic, action, or word. I like to think of it as kind of an umbrella description of who God is. Anything that you can say about God can be described as holy. So his love is holy, his wrath is holy, his justice is holy, his mercy is holy, his nose is holy. Anything you can say about God can be described as holy because he is supremely holy. The description applies to his every characteristic, every action, every word. The description is often attached to his name, uh, his name being a very personal expression of his absolute perfection. Holy, holy is the Lord Almighty, holy is his name. Only God is holy, and yet he expects his people to be holy. Thanks be to God, he has made a way for us who are not holy to still be holy, to be able to be in his holy presence. This repetition of the term holy, 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 is uh, indicates emphasis or importance. Often in English, when we're repetitive, it's considered redundant. However, in, in the Hebrew thought, this emphasis is uh, symbolic, of, or, I'm sorry, the repetition is symbolic of emphasis or important. So he's not just holy, he's not just holy, holy, but he is holy, holy, holy. He is the holiest. Uh, this is the only description of God, as far as I understand, that is taken to the third degree. And remember that numbers in scripture have symbol symbolic meaning many times, and three especially is a really important one that is symbolic of supremeness or completeness. He is supremely holy. He is completely holy. He is holy. 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 Uh, this three degrees of holiness is found in scripture here in Isaiah 6 and also in Revelation 4, the passage that we looked at earlier, where God is worshipped, holy, almighty, eternal creator and sustainer. The seraphs were calling to one another, holy, holy, holy is the Lord almighty. The whole earth is full of his glory. His glory fills the earth in the same way that his train fills the temple. This is a picture of his transcendence and eminence coming together again. 
He is so big and so far beyond us, so transcendent, that his glory fills the entire earth. But the fact that it's the earth that it fills is a beautiful image of his eminence. He shows himself to us. He allows us to have relationship with us, with, with him. He reveals himself to us so that we can respond to him. At the sound of their voices, the doorposts and thresholds shook, and the temple was filled with smoke. Isaiah is describing an earthquake, a reminder that even inanimate objects react at the mention of God's name. So God has revealed himself. Isaiah can't help but respond. And he doesn't respond by just basking in the glory of God. He doesn't respond by just enjoying that nice, warm worship fuzzy that we get uh, so many times when we approach God in worship, he responds with, Woe to me! I'm ruined. I'm a man of unclean lips. I live among a people of unclean lips, and my eyes have seen the King, the Lord Almighty. He has seen God for who he is, and in the light of who God is, he can't help but see himself for who he is, and the reality that he is not holy, 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 and that he needs forgiveness, that he needs change. Isaiah sees God for all he is. God reveals Isaiah sees himself for what he is. Woe to me! I am ruined. I am undone. His response is confession of sin in the light of holiness, the holiness of God. He confesses that he has unclean lips and that he lives among a people of unclean lips. Unclean lips, of course, is not to be taken literally. Uh, it's symbolic of his speech, but not just of his speech, but also of his thoughts and of his actions. Remember that out of the overflow of the heart, the mouth speaks. So God has revealed himself. Isaiah has responded. And then we continue in the story. One of the seraphs flew to me with a live coal in his hand, which he had taken with tongs from the altar. With it, he touched my mouth and said, See, this has touched your lips. Your guilt is taken away and your sin atoned for. The seraph here works as an intercessor, as a mediator, as the go-between between God and man. The coal touching the lips is symbolic of the removal of the prophet's guilt and sin. God so beautifully, so mercifully, so graciously ministers at the point of the confessed need. Isaiah says, I'm a man of unclean lips. I live among a people of unclean lips. And so the seraph, God's worker, God's intercessor, ministers right there, takes that coal right to the mouth, to those unclean lips, and touches him with it. The guilt is taken away. The sin is atoned for. God demands holiness and repentance, but he doesn't leave us there. He also gives forgiveness and atonement. Isaiah continues, Then I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send, and who will go for us? And I said, Here am I, send me. That us rings of the Trinity. God demands, but he also gives, and he needs someone to go and tell. Isaiah responds, Here am I, send me. We go back to uh, John Piper. I, I, this passage from Isaiah is such a beautiful example of missions motivated by worship. Rather than missions trying to replace worship, uh, missions becoming central or, or taking priority over worship, it's this beautiful reality that, that missions comes out of worship. Let, let Piper say it better. Missions is not the ultimate goal of the church. Worship is. Missions exist because worship doesn't. Worship is ultimate, not missions. Remember, worship is more than just what happens on Sunday morning. Remember, worship is more than just four or five Hillsong songs, okay? Think think big when we talk worship here. Don't, don't put worship in a box as Piper's talking, okay? So worship is ultimate, not missions, because God is ultimate, not man. When this age is over and the countless millions of the redeemed fall on their faces before the throne of God, missions will be no more. It is a temporary necessity. It is a necessity. Remember, it is a necessity. But it's a temporary necessity. But worship abides forever. Worship, therefore, is the fuel and goal of missions. It's the goal of missions because in missions we simply aim to bring the nations into the white hot enjoyment of God's glory. The goal of missions is the gladness of the peoples and the greatness of God. The Lord reigns. Let the earth rejoice. Let the many coastlands be glad. Let the peoples praise thee, O God. Let all the peoples praise thee. Let the nations be glad and sing for joy. But worship is also the fuel of missions. Passion for God in worship precedes the offer of God in preaching. You can't commend what you don't cherish. 
Missionaries will never call out, Let the nations be glad, who cannot say from the heart, I rejoice in the Lord. I will be glad and exult in thee. I will sing praise to thy name, O Most High. Missions begins and ends in worship. So we remember that worship is a pattern of revelation and response. It's God who initiates worship. He reveals himself. Then we respond. And one of the best ways for us to articulate how he has revealed himself and, and who he has revealed himself to be is by looking at his many names. Uh, you've got an, an article in your reading this week on the names of God that talks about the power of names, particularly biblical names, and then it gives a number of names for God the Father, God the Son, and God the Spirit. Uh, God the Father especially, we have a number of names from, uh, in the Old Testament that were attributed to him that the worshipers use those names depending on their specific circumstances. And so those names really help us begin to articulate who he is and how he's revealed himself. As you read through that article on the names of God and worship, I want to challenge you to ask yourself some questions. These questions will help point you toward uh, your, your Theology of Worship project, but more than that, um, these questions I really believe are the difference between getting through a class and actually learning something, letting um, this reality of who he is and, and how he's revealed himself change how you respond to him. So just some, some questions. How does this objective knowledge, how does this head knowledge fit your subjective experience? How does this information affect your worship? When in your life have, has he been this for you? Or ask yourself, if you were to write a, name about God, uh, write a song about God's name, what name would you choose? Why? Or what song would you write? Or think about corporate worship at your church. How are the names of God used there? Do we do kind of a perfunctory, Dear Lord, thank you for this day, because that's what we've always done? Or do we do a good job of, 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 the, of uh, using the breadth of names that are available to us to call upon him? Do the names of God need to be invoked even more? And if so, how? Now, how all this comes in to the Biblical Theology of Worship assignment is, is we're moving into step three. In step three, you're going to list eight to 12 names or characteristics, actions and expectations of God the Father, five to nine for God the Son, and three to five for God the Spirit. A tool I've, that that I distribute to my undergraduate students. You are welcome to use this tool if you want to. You are certainly not obligated to do so. What I've found with my undergraduate students is if they use this tool, it helps keep them on task to remember that we're not just talking about some random name or characteristic, but we're also talking about what he's done that helps us understand that he is that and then what he expects from us in light of that. So it's basically just a chart. Uh, and so this this one that, that really you you got to make sure you include this one in your paper. He's holy. Uh, God the Father is holy. We see uh, just a couple of examples of uh, biblical support for that. Of course, there's support throughout Scripture. You don't need to try to list every one. Uh, but give me some good, strong examples in a healthy way with their context of God the, God the Father being holy. And so I've given you Isaiah 6, 3 and Revelation 4, 8. What has he done to show us that he's holy? Well, he is. He was and he is and he is to come. And he has made perfect forever those who are being made holy. In light of the fact that he is holy and that he has shown himself to be holy, he expects his people to be holy as he is holy. So I take that raw information and I put it together into a paragraph. So, for example, God the Father has revealed himself to be a holy God. Isaiah 6, Revelation 4. He is eternally holy and he expects his people to be holy just as he is holy. He works in the lives of his unholy people to make their holiness possible. He has made perfect forever those who are being made holy. And so you see we take the raw data uh, and, and use a concordance, use uh, Logos, use whatever online version of a concordance you use to find those. Make sure you're being fair to their context though. Don't just grab a characteristic of God that, that happens to be one of your favorites and hey look there's a verse so it's good. Make sure that you're being fair to the verses in their context. Take that raw data and turn it into paragraph form. So step three, we've got eight to 12 characteristics, actions and expectations for God the Father, five to nine for God the Son, and three to five for God the Spirit. This will by far be the most time consuming part of the Biblical Theology of Worship paper. Uh, honestly, it's not difficult. It shouldn't be difficult. Uh, there are some wonderful tools that will help you find these things, but it will be time consuming. And, and that's the the feedback I've gotten from students year after year after year of, of using this methodology, 
I thought it was going to be easy. It really wasn't that hard. It just took a lot longer than I expected to. So give yourself time to do that. Remember, we are not going to try to uh, be fully comprehensive. There's no way that we're going to be able to fully describe who God is. So be concise. Uh, but make sure that in that 8 to 12 or 5 to 9 or 3 to 5 names, whichever one you're on, make sure that you pick the best. The, 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 I don't want to say best because they're all so wonderful. Uh, but the, the strongest ones that you really feel like you need to pull uh, to, to draw attention to. Um, don't just grab the first eight that you find. Make sure that you can defend why these are, are strong, important characteristics for, for who, how we can know who God is. Um, so... 8 to 12 for God the Father, 5 to 9 for God the Son, 3 to 5 for God the Spirit. Um, use that tool if it's helpful for you. Don't use it if it's not. But again, make sure you're being fair to your scripture passages in their context, both uh, literary context and historical context. Give support for every statement that you make, just like in the example sentence that I showed you on the last slide. And, and then uh, just to pick the very best ones that you can. If you have questions, please, 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 please feel free to email me. I'll get back to you as quickly as I can. My schedule's a little crazy right now with summer, but uh, I'll get back to you as fast as I can. And uh, give yourself plenty of time to work on this part. I will talk to you.